Thomas Galli and Flaminia Giacomini from Perimeter Institute. So please. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, very good. Okay. Okay, so thanks a lot for this nice invitation. Uh, we are very happy to, uh, to give this talk here. So uh, yeah, this is a joint talk with Tom, uh, Thomas Galli. And uh, the work that is, uh, it's taken from is uh, also with John Salvi. And you can see it in this, uh, uh, on it's, this is the archive number. And we hope to have a revised version on the archive soon. Um, so the, the topic of the talk is the uh, no-go no theorem on the nature of the gravitational field beyond quantum theory. And the motivation for this work comes from the recent experimental effort that has been uh, put into measuring the gra uh, gravitational coupling between smaller and smaller objects. In particular, the, this slide that I have here is the state of the art and this is a very recent uh, experiment in Marcus Aspelmeyer's group in Vienna, where they managed to measure the gravitational coupling between two 90 milligram nanospheres, which is uh, extremely small. And so the, gravitation, the, the gravitational field sorts by these nanospheres, not with the Earth. Um, and the interest in this type of experimental work comes from a long debate, a long theoretical debate that uh, we can take back to the uh, Chapel Hill Conference where many people in 1957, where many people gathered to discuss uh, many topics among which the uh, quantization of the gravitational field. And Richard Feynman um, at some point uh, proposed a thought experiment where a massive body was put in a special superposition. And he concluded that if you believe in quantum mechanics up to any level, then you have to believe in gravitational quantization in order to describe this experiment. And since then, uh, many authors have discussed uh, what it means to put a mass in a special superposition or which type of properties space time acquires. But recently, uh, there have been two papers that came out on the same day on the archive. And these papers changed the experimental protocol and they proposed to have instead two masses that you can see here. Uh, let's call this A and B. And these two masses are prepared in a quantum superposition of uh, two states left and right and interact gravitationally. And after and they, they're sent through an interferometer and uh, after, at the end of the interferometer, the two masses are entangled. So uh, they, uh, they use the, the fact that the gravitational field is, um, is a field, so the field nature of gravity, and the LOCC argument that local operations and classical communication cannot generate entanglement in order to deduce that the gravitational field is quantum. So the, um, there has been, after these papers, a uh, quite lively debate about, uh, and the, the, the crucial point of the debate, as we will see, is what can you deduce exactly if you, on the nature of the gravitational field, if you measure entanglement uh, generation via the gravitational field. But let's take a step back and um, let's wonder, let, let's ask, what does it mean to look for a quantum description of the gravitational field? So does this mean that we should really quantize gravity as like, like the other fields? No, not necessarily. So gravity, gravity should not be necessarily intended as a quantum field that, because we do not know which features the final quantum theory of gravity will have. So it could be anything. And um, do we have to measure uh, the gravitational field directly in order to deduce any non-classical properties of the gravitational field. So, of course, this would be great. It would be like measuring single photons in the electromagnetic case, but this is really hard. Uh, we do not have the experimental capability of doing that now. Um, and people are not even like hoping that they will be able to do it in a few years. 
And, but what we are going to, uh, to argue here and what we're going to rely on is that, that we can test the gravitational field indirectly. So we test the matter degrees of freedom and we infer features on the gravitational field. And the final question uh, that we can ask is, uh, what is gravity? Like, what is the nature of gravity? Is it uh, uh, classical quantum or uh, is it something else? And there are many alternative models that have been proposed, which uh, are neither classical nor quantum, but usually they're not characterized. And so we are just going to focus on three of them, and uh, Thomas will tell you more uh, about this which are the Schrodinger-Newton equation, collapse models, and gravitational decoherence. So just to set the stage of which features of these models are going to be relevant for our discussion that well, Tom will tell you more about, um, let me just uh, give you a very short uh, description of the main features of each one of these three models. So the Schrodinger-Newton equation is uh, a nonlinear modification of the Schrodinger equation. And it has nonlinear dynamics at the level of the density matrix and at the level of the vector state. It can generate entanglement between two masses, and it can be derived from a semi-classical gravity approach. What does this mean? This, uh, it means that this is a model that wants to retain the classicality of the gravitational field. So the metric is not uh, a, uh, it's not quantized, it is classical. So if you take the Einstein's equations, on the left-hand side, there's the metric, on the right-hand side, there's matter. And uh, nature gives us a quantum, quantum matter, so a quantum stress energy tensor that is on the right-hand side. And, uh, but in, in this approach, you want to keep the metric as classical. So what, uh, what you can do is to put a, an expectation value around the stress energy tensor. And, uh, what you do, and you find if you do that, uh, the Schrodinger Newton equation. And in addition, it has been uh, often claimed that it violates no signaling. And again, Thomas will tell you a bit more about this point. Uh, then uh, the second model is collapse models, which is also a nonlinear modification of the Schrodinger equation. But here, the nonlinearities only arise at the level of the vector state but not uh, at the level of the dense density matrix. And in fact, if you look at the dynamical evolution of the density matrix, this is written as an open quantum system. Uh, however, it is not known what the relation to gravity uh, is. And G appears in the equations, but it is put by hand. And finally, uh, gravitational decoherence is an effective field theory model of gravity and where you take a perturbative approach to gravity and uh, you have the, the matter systems are in a graviton bath. Uh, so basically gravity acts as an environment which leads to decoherence and that you, you cannot measure. And so basically this is a model that is operationally classical and it does not lead to entanglement generation. But not now, uh, if we want to go back to our initial thought experiment where entanglement is generated by the gravitational interaction, then uh, we can think of a simpler situation where we have two masses, the blue mass on the left and the red mass on the right, uh, which are coupled via a spring. And this spring, uh, we, des we describe it as a non-local potential, a non-local interacting potential, depending on the distance between uh, mass B and mass A. And um, initially, we prepare one of the two masses, the one on the left, in a, super, in a quantum superposition of initial states. And if we let the whole state evolve, after some time, what we will observe is that uh, there is entanglement generated via the dynamical evolution. So now, is this generation of entanglement enough for us to conclude that V is quantum? Well, of course not, because what, what determines here the fact that we have entanglement is the non-local interaction and the initial state that was quantum of the particle B that was in a superposition. And this is this, a similar objection that has been raised against the, the, this entanglement generation by the Newtonian potential. 
which is that the fact that the generation of entanglement is due to the quantumness of the matter and not to the quantumness of the gravitational field, because the Newtonian potential is not a real degree of freedom. So is this the end of the story? Does this mean that we cannot learn anything on the nature of the gravitational field from these experiments? Uh, no, uh, I, I think that the situation is a bit subtler. And um, because we know general relativity, we know that uh, gravity has a field character, so we can use it. And in order to give you a better intuition of why the situation is a bit subtler than um, what uh, than the example with the spring, then let me revise a thought experiment that um, we had in this paper here. And in turn, we uh, this is the gravitational version of a thought experiment that was studied in these two papers, especially in this one to, uh, in, uh, in this paper in 2016. So um, here we assume that gravity is a field. So gravity. Um, there is no interaction at a distance, interactions are local, and that G has its own quantum state. And we also used a specific approach to the quantization of gravity, which is linearized quantum gravity, where loosely speaking, you can decompose the gravitational field into a background that here we take as Minkowski and into a perturbation that is quantum, uh, and that is a spin to field on Minkowski background. So long before the experiment starts, um, an experimenter, Alice, prepares uh, this blue mass in a special superposition of two positions. And this is a mass that sources a gravitational field. Then at some distance d from A, uh, there is another experimenter, Bob, who uh, instead uh, puts this red mass in a trap. Uh, this is a, a very strong trap. So initially, the state of Bob does not feel the gravitational field here. And then at some initial time of the experiment zero, then uh, so, uh, th this is the state that you have. So you have an entangled state of A with, its, uh, with her gravitational field, where these are coherent states of the gravitational field. And the state of Bob is in a product state. And at, at the time, at initial time t equal to zero, Bob can uh, make a choice he can either decide to switch off the trap or he can keep the trap on. If Bob keeps the trap on, then the state is not going to change. This is the state. And, uh, but if instead Bob re, uh, switches off the trap, then what's, what happens is that uh, uh, the, par the, the red particle starts feeling the gravitational field of A. And then it's uh, after some time TB, uh, Bob gets entangled with A and her gravitational field. So after this time TB, we will have this three-body entangled state. And then at some point during this experiment, it doesn't really matter when, uh, Alice uh, can decide to close the superposition by performing a reverse Serger like experiment. And now, uh, you, can, you can see from this state, from the state that we had before, that according to whether Bob is entangled with Alice or not, A will either see interference or not see it. Uh, so basically, the, the question is, can Alice see interference? Um, and from this interference, can she deduce what Bob did before a light crossing time? And so the, the, the discussion of the different cases is not straightforward and I don't have time to uh, go through that now, but the conclusion is that Alice cannot deduce anything fa uh, faster than light, but in order, for, uh, not, uh, in order not to have any faster than light signaling, uh, there are two mechanisms uh, that are uh, proper of a quantum description of the gravitational field. And these two mechanisms are the vacuum fluctuations of the gravitational field and the emission of quantized gravitational radiation. So um, notice that this whole, uh, so the only thing that we assumed in this thought experiment was a Newtonian interaction. This is the only thing that we needed. And this is not an approximation. This was the exact description of the situation. So the conclusion 
is that the interaction by the Newtonian field is not as harmless as it seems, and that the state of the Newtonian field should be considered as entangled with the state of A and B. And that the, for this reason, there is some quantum information content of the Newtonian field. We do not give a full answer to this question. And a corollary of this um, result is that uh, the Newtonian field is a physical degree of freedom. So it, has, it, it should be considered as a physical degree of freedom unless one is ready to give up the no faster than light signaling principle. And uh, so the, now the, the question that we want to ask and that Tom will answer is the following. Provided that we observe gravitational induced entanglement in the laboratory, which conclusions can we draw on the nature of the gravitational field? And with this, I will hand the talk to Tom. Great, thanks, Flaminia. Um, yeah, can everyone see the screen okay? Yes, general probabilistic theories. This is what yeah. we see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. Okay, okay thanks, Flaminia. So, yeah, um, what we're going to try and do is answer this question, making as few assumptions as possible on the on the nature of the gravitational field. Okay, so we do know that it's um, a physical degree of freedom, as Flaminia argued, and so we'll be modeling it as a, a general probabilistic system. It's a general probabilistic theory, so this is this framework, which allows us to um, kind of model most conceivable theories, okay? They've, they, we make really minimal assumption. So it could be a quantum quantum theory, classical theory, some of the alternative models we discussed, or really any conceivable um, theory you might have. So there's been a few talks already on, on GPTs, general probabilistic theories. Um, and yeah, I won't be giving an exhaustive um, account of GPTs, but I'll just highlight a few features um, which are important in order to answer this question. Okay, so, the first example I want to give is just um, how we derive the state space of a qubit. So this is well known. And then I'll move on to um, deriving the state space of some alternative theories. OK. And the, this notion of state space, the space of mixed state, is common to all GPTs, essentially. OK, so what's a qubit? We have pure states, which are some uh, rays, some uh, two-dimensional complex projective space. OK. We have measurements whose outcome probabilities are given by the Born rule. Okay, here note, this is a quadratic function of the pure states, and we can prepare ensembles. Okay, so with probability pi, I can uh, prepare state psi i. And, you know, then the probability of outcome a for this ensemble p is just the weighted sum of the probabilities for the individual elements. Okay, now the key, key step in GPT is it that there also exists a representation, okay, where probabilities are linear in the states. So, now, this Born rule here, okay, we can rewrite it in this trace form, trace of projector A with this object, ket bra, psi, psi, okay. So now what we have is that here the states before were elements of this PC2, and now the states, okay, they're elements of, well, they're the Hermitian operators on C2, okay, so this four-dimensional real vector space. And in this representation, probabilities are linear functions of the states, okay, and ensembles now can be written as these convex combinations of these states. Okay, these are the mixed states. And the key point here is that any theory you, you can conceive of, there exists this representation of it, this mixed state representation, this GPT representation, in which you can write ensembles as convex combinations like this, okay, and probabilities are linear. You can also show that transformations are linear. And this is the kind of structure which is shared by all theories, okay, this convex linear structure, okay, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll see um, why it's important in a bit. Okay, so just to give you um, just a bit more intuition, I'm going to now going to derive the space of mixed states for some alternative um, theory, okay, which is not quantum. Okay, and so these are the theories which um, Luis Masanes talked about earlier. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the talk due to time zone uh, differences. And so these are theories which have the same pure states as quantum mechanics. Okay, but now the measurement outcomes, instead of being linear function, uh, sorry, quadratic, quadratic functions, now there's to the power of four. Okay. And now when I want to write them out as linear functions of some object, 
I need to take the projector, the trace of the projector, tensor two, and this projector now, tensor two. Okay. okay it turns out for other reasons, you, you need some to complete measurements. You also need some operators A, which are not of this form. But that doesn't matter too much. The key point is that now we're linear, this psi psi tensor two. Okay, so now they span the space of the Hermitian operators acting on the symmetric subspace of C2 tensor C2. Doesn't matter too much what that is. The main thing is R8. Okay, so now your space of, of mixed states, uh, this convex set, okay, because you take convex combinations, convex set living in this eight dimensional space. Okay, so just to give you a bit of an, an idea, um, maybe more of like um, an intuition for what this means to have two systems with the same pure states and different mixed states. Um, I want to give a kind of a simple example. Okay, so this is an example which um, Luis might have had in his, his talk as well. So I'm just going to take a slice of the block sphere. Okay, so we have this circle here, and we have these mixed states. And you can notice, for instance, so for the qubit, the 50 50 mixture of 0, 1, represented by the midpoint here is the same as the 50-50 mixture of plus minus. It's the identity over two. Now instead consider this circle here. So now this has been embedded in three dimensions. Okay, it's a bit like a Pringle shape. So it's still a circle. Okay, but when I take the convex hole of it, okay, so I, I, I fill it in, I have a different state space. So this is an example I have shown you of two state spaces. They're these convex sets with the same pure states, both of them are circles, but they have these different mixed states. Okay, and they have these different mixed states because they have different measurements. Good. So what's the general GPT system? You have mixed states, which are given by some convex set, and probabilities of measurement outcomes are linear functions on that set. They're called effects. Dynamics are linear in the, in the mixed states, and there's some rules for composition, how you put two systems together, which I won't go into. Again, in fact, then an arbitrary convex set any convex set you can imagine corresponds to some hypothetical system. Okay. Good. And so the, you know, the quantum convex sets are just a very specific class of these. Okay. So one very important GPT system for the purpose of our discussion about whether you know, the gravitational field, um, you know, what's its nature, is it classical, is you know, what is a classical GPT system? So the set of mixed states are just probability distributions over some set X. Okay. And this state space is called a simplex. So for instance, if you have just two points in your set, zero and one, the space of probability distributions over that is just this line segment here. One extremal point here at the end is probability of the first uh, element being one, and the second point is the probability that the, the second extremal point is the probability distribution, which gives probability one to the second element, okay? And then for three, you form a triangle, then for four, you have this tetrahedron, and so on. Okay, and this can generalize if you have uh, X is some compact um, space, you have the so uh, a Shoke simplex. Okay, so now that I've given this kind of brief overview, let, let's return to um, the, the Flami Flaminia's question. So Flaminia kind of argued that the gravitational field is physical, okay, from this like no fast and light signaling. Okay, so we'll model it as a system, but we cannot directly measure it. Okay, so we have this indirect access to it. So you know what's what's what does indirect access look like? Well, for instance, let's say that G here is some system we don't have access to, but we have access to A. We could prepare A in some state, interact it with G, and then we can't measure G, but then we can make some measurements on A to infer something about G. Okay, so this is, for instance, um, the von Neumann measurement scheme. Okay, where A is your experimental apparatus, G is the quantum system. You entangle them together, and then you measure the experimental apparatus to infer something about the quantum system. And the, the setup we're using, though, does not have just one system, but two systems, OK? So we have A and B and G, OK? And then we want to infer something on the nature of G just by looking at what happens to A and B. So now I'll go to the, to the main theorem, which is the following. So we have two non-classical systems, A and B. OK, they don't have to be quantum qubits. They're just non-classical, which means non-simplicial. Initially, in a separable state and the gravitational field G. We assume that the only interactions are gravitational, so we've managed to kind of isolate A and B from other um, external systems or influences. Okay. Then we have the theorem says that the, the following statements are incompatible. One, gravitational field is 
so uh, altogether incompatible. So one of them has to be violated, at, at least. So one, the gravitational field is G is able to generate entanglement. Two, A and B interact locally via the mediator G. And three, G is classical. Okay, so what do these um, mean? So we have the first one says that it's only, in GPTs, there's a, a notion of entanglement, which is the same as in quantum theory, that the state of AB is not uh, separable. Okay, and here this star is because in a generic GPT, the composite is not necessarily given by the tensor product, but just some uh, bilinear map. What does two mean? A and B interact locally by the mediator G. Well, in a circuit description, it means you can break down the interaction, okay, between the three systems, as some pairwise interaction between AG, followed by some pairwise interaction between GB, and so on. You can then have it followed by another interaction between AG and then GB. But A and B never interact directly. Can 3G is classical means, well, it's, um, it's a GPT system which state, whose state spaces are simplex. And also, it composes with other systems according to the standard tensor product rule. OK, so one point here is we do not assume subsystem independence, okay, which is also uh, known as causality or no signaling, slightly confusingly. OK, and so this we, we don't want to assume. So what does this mean? Um, you violate subsystem independence when you have an entangled state and the local operation on one subsystem can immediately affect the other one. The reason we um, don't want to assume this, so we want to allow for theories which um, violate subsystem independence, is because we don't necessarily expect G to be independent of A as a degree of freedom. It's a physical degree of freedom, but we don't necessarily want to assume it's independent of the other ones, right? Because changing the state of matter, you expect would change the gravitational field. Anyway, what I want to do now is use the theorem to kind of classify existing approaches, as well as suggest new possibilities. So let's look at violation of condition one. Sorry, just let me check the time. Okay, so violation of condition one says there's no entanglement generation. Again, this, for instance, fits the collapse models uh, that Flaminio is telling us about, to capture these open quantum systems, um, and also uh, gravitational decoherence, okay? Where we have that even though the gravitational field is, um, is described in a quantum manner, because of we can't access it fully, okay, it's effectively classical. And so in our framework, or the GPT framework rather, um, this is what's important. So for instance, if it, you tell me you have a qubit, but you can only measure the Z basis, okay, so you can't ever detect any coherence, we'd say you have an operationally classical system. Okay, so gravitational decoherence enters here, violation of condition one. So we have that um, two is met, right? So the, the, these are classical fields which uh, interact locally with A and B. They don't generate entanglement and they're classical. Good. So vi violation of condition two is quite interesting. It's the case where we have so the gravitational field doesn't locally mediate entanglement, uh, doesn't locally yet mediate the interaction, but it can generate entanglement and it's classical, okay? Again, this is the case of the Schrodinger-Newton equation, for instance, okay? So the classical field which generates entanglement, it just doesn't do so in this kind of local manner. Um, so an, imp an important thing to notice about the Schrodinger-Newton equation is actually, it's, it's this kind of very exotic, um, or this, reasonably exotic GPT system, let's say. Because when you change the dynamics, you change the measurements, and then you need to rederive the set of mixed states, as I discussed earlier, okay? Because you add new measurements, you need to rederive the set of mixed states. It turns out when you do this, so Milnick showed this in the 80s, that the state spaces are classical. So for these Schrodinger newton equations, the systems have the same pure states as quantum mechanics, but the, the state space is a simplex, an infinite dimensional simplex, okay? So these theories have classical systems which compose non-classically. They're assuming you can fully derive. No, we, yeah. Typically, people, when they work in the Schrodinger-Newton equation, they don't rederive the state space and show the full consistency of the operational theory. But assuming it exists, such theories which have classical um, state spaces which compose non-classically, there's examples of, of some of them in finite dimensions, then they violate condition two, but to obey condition one and three. Okay, now the, the final condition, which is um, the more interesting one for us at least, because it suggests kind of new things, is a violation of condition three, okay, which says that G is classical. So now there's the possibility that G is non-classical. So, okay, 
what there's there are different ways this could happen. So we have that A and B are quantum and G is quantum. So this is kind of the case uh, which people explored bef before. And these are the papers that Bose and it all knowledge of Vidral were exploring. Okay, that if there's entanglement generated between A and B, which is assumed to be quantum, then G must be quantum. There's also this second possibility that A and B are quantum. Okay, there's entanglement generated between them, but G is, is non classical and non quantum. So some other GPT system. Okay. And the third possibility is that A and B, we don't even need to assume they're qubits, just they're non classical. And if entanglement is generated between them, then G itself is not classical. Okay, so I'm going to go into a bit more detail about these. So good. we have the first case. We have two qubits. G is non-classical, non-quantum. So we have some examples of these, for instance, the real or quaternion quantum systems, okay, which is you just take quantum theory, but instead of defining it over C, you define it over the reals or quaternions. Okay, these would be examples of systems which could um, generate entanglement between A and B quantum. Um, this leads to the following open question. If I observe entanglement between two qubits, which is mediated by the gravitational field, can I, can I um, constrain the set of all non-classical systems which can mediate entanglement between these quantum systems? What, what, what is this set? Okay, so generically, if you just give me an arbitrary non-classical system, it won't be able to you know, interact with quantum systems and generate entanglement just from consistency constraints from this operational framework. So we could ask, you know, what is the set of all non-classical systems which can generate entanglement between quantum systems? This would really allow us to kind of pinpoint down, you know, because here our theorem tells us that given these experiments, if you generate entanglement, it's non-classical. And the next question is to say exactly which non-classical systems this could be. Okay. Because here we have examples, it could be quantum or it could be real or quaternionic. It'd be nice to know the full set of possibilities. Okay, so the final possibility I want to discuss is that A and B are non-classical and G is non-classical. So you might think this is a bit strange because, you know, we know that the kind of setup of the experiment is we know A and B, we can control them very carefully. And we want to infer something about G, which is, you know, uh, not known to us. So why would I not want to assume that A and B are quantum? Well, if we want to kind of future-proof future this, you know, or we might have reasons to believe that, you know, the quantum description is not the final descriptions of these things, okay, of, of A and B. Again, okay, there might actually be some um, future theory, which is non-quantum, okay, which, which actually describes them better. So we, the case of interest is when A and B kind of are approximately quantum, okay, that given our current capabilities, they appear quantum, but really they're uh, non-quantum, okay? And in this case, the theorem still holds, okay, because it applies to non-classical A and B. So examples of these are these quantum systems with hidden measurements I described before. So we had that, you know, now we had measurements which are linear in this object here. So this includes, you know, if A is of the form some operator tensor I, you recover the quantum measurements. Okay, so these describe quantum systems with uh, extra measurements. Okay, so A and B appear quantum because we can't do the extra measurements, but fundamentally they're these, you know, post-quantum systems. Okay, another example here is discretized quantum systems. Okay, so maybe it turns out, so, okay, what's a discretized quantum system? If you take a qubit, for instance, the block sphere, you then consider a discretization of the block sphere. Okay, so it may be that our current experimental capabilities don't allow us to detect that fundamentally, um, you know, this, this, the pure states are discrete. Okay, and why is this an interesting um, possibility? Well, Marcus Mueller, who gave a talk earlier, and others have suggested that this could follow from um, a discrete nature of space-time, okay, would lead to this. So these, uh, yeah, have also kind of added motivation why you might want to consider A and B as themselves, not quantum, but just uh, non-classical. Okay, good. So yeah, I think there's five minutes left, so I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, okay, so the key takeaway point from this talk is that entanglement between test masses does not entail that G is quantum. So just to say, I mean, there is about six minutes, but this would include the question time. So do not okay. use all of the five minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so entanglement between test masses does not entail that G is quantum. Rather, it's non-classical in some sense. Okay. Moreover, we do not even need to assume that A and B are themselves quantum. They could be post-quantum. And yes, yeah, so there's a few more, there's a few open questions. Um, in the in the paper, but one of them 
you know, kind of of interest from a GPT perspective is can we classify all GPTs which can mediate entanglement between qubits A and B? And yeah, I think I'll finish there. I'll just encourage people if they're interested not to read the paper because as Flamina said, it's going to be updated very soon. So yeah, if you're interested in this, maybe early next week, there should be a V2 out. And yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. That's a very funny suggestion you have at the end. Do not read our paper. Anyway, yes, uh, it's a very nice talk. I mean, two seemingly different parts, but in the end, they all got together. So the theorem seems very powerful, right? And I, I'm, I'm curious to see how actually, I mean, what can we say from experiments? Because experiments are catching up. So even if, according to what you say, even if we get uh, an ambiguous detection of entanglement, then we cannot conclude that the nature of gravity is definitely quantum. It is non-classical, sure, yeah. but we don't know whether there's more, right? Yeah, so one thing we could do is we could say, we could try and assume a few extra things, because yeah, exactly, if we don't make any extra assumptions, we can just say it's non-classical, but we can assume, try and add on some physical principles. People do this in GPTs, you know, you, you add some uh, principles to then derive quantum theory, like Marcus said. Mm -hmm. So you could maybe add some principle like local tomography, and then maybe you'd find that, you know, it had to be quantum, but yeah. Um, yeah, really in this, this approach where you're trying to make no extra assumptions, um, yeah, all we can say is it's non-classical. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, is there, okay. But, Pavel, Pavel, please. Quick question. You said you didn't assume causality mm. or system independence, but you had to assume some, some weaker version of it, right? Or no? No, so the, what is responsible? What is responsible for not having a very trivial, you know, full-time influence in the, between the parties, right? Usually yeah. we, we assume, usually we assume this causality acts yeah. independent. So what do you have instead of that here? So okay, so yeah, the proof itself is done in this um like the OPT framework from the Pavia group, you know, this kind of diagrammatic way. And so the, the key step is that if G is classical, you can actually, you can decompose, uh, you have this decomposition into the identity. Um, so that's a kind of key step of that. But yeah, it's just using this kind of diagrammatic way and it's an LOCC argument, right? So it's the same argument as the earlier proposals, but just extended to GPTs. And so it turns out for this LOCC argument, you don't ever need to use this like, um, this, uh, yeah, this trace this existence of a unique deterministic effect. So in this LOCC, if I trace out the Alice part, hmm. do I have independent, the Bob part independent on what, what Alice did or not? So, okay, so... On the level of, of operations. Mm -hmm. So are you asking LOCC? So you mean that G is classical and A and B are non-classical? Yes, yes. So, so I'm saying, is there anything like, like um, you know, in in CPTP, you you have mm -hmm. the thing that 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 kind of the, the local action wouldn't influence the other part. So I mean, yeah, here you do. I, I I expect you should have such such a thing here. But I'm not sure. Yeah, you would. So when yeah, exactly when G is classical. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because the classical the classical theory is causal, then exactly you have that that works fine. The possibility right. we'd have right is that G, B, and A are all non-classical, and here you could have you know you don't necessarily need causality. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, it sounds more clear for me now. Thank you. Yeah. We have another. Thanks. We have another quick question. Q Pecky, I don't know who you are. Oh, hi, Gerard, it's me, Lucas, sorry. Ah, Lucas, hi. <laughs> oh, nice to see you, virtually at least. Yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, oh, I have a, just a quick question. Maybe, maybe I lost something. Uh, please, Thomas, could you please go back to slide 15? Yeah, uh, here I have a question. Hmm. Uh, if you assume that the gravitational field is non-classical, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Uh, so this means that we do not have a background metric. So, and you're assuming that A and B are quantum systems. Mm -hmm. And by this, I understand that that's described by Hubert spaces. Mm -hmm. My question is, without defining a, a background metric, how do you define a Hubert spaces? 
Mm-hmm. Um, can I? Because we, we, we don't have Cauchy hypersurfaces. So I, I don't understand the, how to define so, Hubert spaces there. So, I, okay, maybe I'll, I'll give my answer and then if Flaminia also wants to jump in. Okay. Yeah, because she, she, yeah. Um, so I would say that we define the systems just so these experiments in the lab. Right, we're kind of defining these things operationally. We know that in the lab, the experimenters they have you know this control, the test masses, and they can prepare them in a variety of states and do these measurements, and then they can reconstruct. Yeah, yeah but for this, yeah, but for this, we we do need to define Hubert spaces in order to define projectors uh, and things like this. I mean, in the lab, I think we we don't need. We, oh, sorry, we can, my camera is off. Um, uh, that's okay. Um, I would say that we kind of infer Hilbert spaces. So what we obtain. Right, we do all this tomography, and then we we find that the state space looks like a block sphere, for instance. And then from this, you know, we can infer. So at the GPT level, you don't even really need Hilbert spaces. Like, you would typically start from the this convex set of mixed states. So yeah, I would kind of say that you know, if in your lab you have these these systems, right, these degrees of freedom you can control, you can reconstruct the state space. And from this, you can infer quantum theory, right? That they're quantum. All we mean is that you generate quantum statistics. So, so, so uh, I can say that locally, I do assume that you have a background uh, space time, well defined. I mean, mm-hmm. in order to prepare experiments and to do experiments, we need a clock on the wall. Yes. Yeah. And we need a rule on the table. So, yeah. Okay. Yes, that I would agree with. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Flaminia, do you want to add something before we move to the break? Uh, yeah, no, just that, um, I mean, in the end, we, these are situations in which the, also the gravitational field is typically macroscopically distinguishable. So we have orthogonal configurations, typically. And, the, and in, that, in, in that situation, we can also define for each amplitude uh, a, a Cauchy surface. So oh, okay. there, there are methods where you, and, yeah, and also you can go to the well, reference frame of this mass, and then there are there, there are other research lines that tell you that in that in that quantum reference frame, then everything is well defined, and there are so so again locally you have a way to make sense of, of that in this specific config, configuration. Oh, oh okay, Th- thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. So there's another question in the chat, but I would say that we can move into the break. And um, if uh, people want to join the breakout room, then discussion can be continued. Thanks again, uh, both of you, Flamini and Thomas, and uh, thanks, Emily, for the talk previously. We will reconvene at 2.50 p.m. Thank you.